Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Chapter 21 In Which the Master of the Tankadier Runs Great Risk of Losing a Reward of Two Hundred Pounds this voyage of eight hundred miles was a perilous venture on a craft of twenty tons, and at that season of the year. The Chinese seas were usually boisterous, subject to terrible gales of wind, and especially during the equinoxes, and it was now early November. It would clearly have been to the master's advantage to carry his passengers to Yokohama, since he was paid a certain sum per day, but he would have been rash to attempt such a voyage, and it was imprudent even to attempt to reach Shanghai. But John Bunsby believed in the tankadier, which rode on the waves like a seagull, and perhaps he was not wrong. Late in the day they passed through the capricious channels of Hong Kong, and the tankadier, impelled by favorable winds, conducted herself admirably. "'I do not need, pilot,' said Phileas Fogg, when they got into the open sea, to advise you to use all possible speed. Trust me, your honor, we are carrying all the sail the wind will let us. The poles would add nothing, and are only used when we are going into port. It's your trade, not mine, pilot, and I confide in you. Phileas Fogg, with body erect and legs wide apart, standing like a sailor, gazed without staggering at the swelling waters. The young woman who was seated aft was profoundly affected as she looked out upon the ocean, darkening now with the twilight, on which she had ventured in so frail a vessel. Above her head rustled the white sails, which seemed like great white wings. The boat, carried forward by the wind, seemed to be flying in the air. Night came. The moon was entering her first quarter, and her insufficient light would soon die out in the mist on the horizon. Clouds were rising from the east, and already overcast a part of the heavens. The pilot had hung out his lights, which was very necessary in these seas crowded with vessels bound landward, for collisions are not uncommon occurrences, and at the speed she was going the least shock would shatter the gallant little craft. Fix, seated in the bow, gave himself up to meditation. He kept apart from his fellow travelers, knowing Mr. Fogg's taciturn tastes. Besides, he did not quite like to talk to the man whose favors he had accepted. He was thinking, too, of the future. It seemed certain that Fogg would not stop at Yokohama, but would at once take the boat for San Francisco, and the vast extent of America would ensure him impunity and safety. Fogg's plan appeared to him the simplest in the world, Instead of sailing directly from England to the United States like a common villain, he had traversed three-quarters of the globe so as to gain the American continent more surely, and there, after throwing the police off his track, he would quietly enjoy himself with the fortune stolen from the bank. But once in the United States, what should he fix do? Should he abandon this man? No, a hundred times no. Until he had secured his extradition he would not lose sight of him for an hour. It was his duty, and he would fulfill it to the end. At all events there was one thing to be thankful for. Passepartout was not with his master, and it was above all important, after the confidences Fix had imparted to him, that the servant should never have speech with his master. Phileas Fogg was also thinking of Passepartout, who had so strangely disappeared. Looking at the matter from every point of view, it did not seem to him impossible that by some mistake the man might have embarked on the Carnatic at the last moment, and this was also Aouda's opinion, who regretted very much the loss of the worthy fellow to whom she owed so much. They might then find him at Yokohama, for if the Carnatic was carrying him thither it would be easy to ascertain if he had been on board. A brisk breeze arose about ten o'clock but though it might have been prudent to take in a reef, the pilot, after carefully examining the heavens, let the craft remain rigged as before. The tankadier bore sail admirably, as she drew a great deal of water, and everything was prepared for high speed in case of a gale. Mr. Fogg and Aouda descended into the cabin at midnight, having been already preceded by Fix, who had lain down on one of the cots. 
the pilot and crew remained on deck all night. At sunrise the next day, which was the 8th of November, the boat had made more than one hundred miles. The log indicated a mean speed of between eight and nine miles. The tankadier still carried all sail and was accomplishing her greatest capacity of speed. If the wind held as it was, the chances would be in her favor. During the day she kept along the coast where the currents were favorable. The coast, irregular in profile and visible sometimes across the clearings, was at most five miles distant. The sea was less boisterous since the wind came off land, a fortunate circumstance for the boat, which would suffer, owing to its small tonnage, by a heavy surge on the sea. The breeze subsided a little towards noon and set in from the southwest. The pilot put up his poles, but took them down again within two hours, as the wind freshened up anew. Mr. Fogg and Aouda, happily unaffected by the roughness of the sea, ate with a good appetite, Fix being invited to share their repast, which he accepted with secret chagrin. To travel at this man's expense and live upon his provisions was not palatable to him. Still he was obliged to eat, and so he ate. When the meal was over, he took Mr. Fogg apart and said, Sir, this sir scorched his lips, and he had to control himself to avoid collaring this gentleman. Sir, you have been very kind to give me a passage on this boat, but though my means will not admit of my expending them as freely as you, I must ask to pay my share. Let us not speak of that, sir, replied Mr. Fogg. But if I insist— No, sir repeated Mr. Fogg in a tone which did not admit of a reply. This enters into my general expenses. Fix, as he bowed, had a stifled feeling, and going forward where he ensconced himself, did not open his mouth for the rest of the day. Meanwhile they were progressing famously, and John Bunsby was in high hope. He several times assured Mr. Fogg that they would reach Shanghai in time, to which that gentleman responded that he counted upon it. The crew set to work in good earnest, inspired by the reward to be gained. There was not a sheet which was not tightened, not a sail which was not vigorously hoisted, not a lurch could be charged to the man at the helm. They worked as desperately as if they were contesting in a royal yacht regatta. By evening the log showed that two hundred and twenty miles had been accomplished from Hong Kong, and Mr. Fogg might hope that he would be able to reach Yokohama without recording any delay in his journal, in which case the many misadventures which had overtaken him since he left London would not seriously affect his journey. The tankadier entered the Straits of Fokien, which separate the island of Formosa from the Chinese coast in the small hours of the night, and crossed the Tropic of Cancer. The sea was very rough in the straits, full of eddies formed by the counter-currents, and the chopping waves broke her course, whilst it became very difficult to stand on deck. At daybreak the wind began to blow hard again, and the heavens seemed to predict a gale. The barometer announced a speedy change, the mercury rising and falling capriciously. The sea also in the southeast raised long surges, which indicated a tempest, the sun had set the evening before in a red mist, in the midst of the phosphorescent scintillations of the ocean. John Bunsby long examined the threatening aspect of the heavens, muttering indistinctly between his teeth. At last he said in a low voice to Mr. Fogg, "'Shall I speak out to your honor?' "'Of course.' "'Well, we are going to have a squall.' "'Is the wind north or south?' asked Mr. Fogg quietly. "'South.' Look, a typhoon is coming up. Glad it's a typhoon from the south, for it will carry us forward. Oh, if you take it that way, said John Bunsby, I've nothing more to say. John Bunsby's suspicions were confirmed. At a less advanced season of the year, the typhoon, according to a famous meteorologist, would have passed away like a luminous cascade of electric flame but in the winter equinox it was to be feared that it would burst upon them with great violence. The pilot took his precautions in advance. He reefed all sail. The pole masts were dispensed with. All hands went forward to the bows. A single triangular sail of strong canvas, 
was hoisted as a storm jib so as to hold the wind from behind. Then they waited. John Bunsby had requested his passengers to go below, but this imprisonment in so narrow a space with little air and the boat bouncing in the gale was far from pleasant. Neither Mr. Fogg, Fix, nor Aouda consented to leave the deck. The storm of rain and wind descended upon them towards eight o'clock, but with its bit of sail the tankadier was lifted like a feather by a wind, an idea of whose violence can scarcely be given. To compare her speed to four times that of a locomotive going on full steam would be below the truth. The boat scudded thus northward during the whole day, borne on by monstrous waves, preserving always, fortunately, a speed equal to theirs. Twenty times she seemed almost to be submerged by these mountains of water which rose behind her, but the adroit management of the pilot saved her. The passengers were often bathed in spray, but they submitted to it philosophically. Fix cursed it, no doubt, but Aouda, with her eyes fastened upon her protector, whose coolness amazed her, showed herself worthy of him, and bravely weathered the storm. As for Phileas Fogg, it seemed just as if the typhoon were a part of his program. Up to this time the tankadier had always held her course to the north, but towards evening the wind, veering three-quarters, bore down from the northwest. The boat, now lying in the trough of the waves, shook and rolled terribly. The sea struck her with fearful violence. At night the tempest increased in violence. John Bunsby saw the approach of darkness, and the rising of the storm with dark misgivings. He thought a while, and then asked his crew if it was not time to slacken speed. After a consultation he approached Mr. Fogg and said, "'I think, Your Honor, that we should do well to make for one of the ports on the coast.' "'I think so, too.' "'Ah,' said the pilot, "'but which one?' "'I know of but one,' returned Mr. Fogg tranquilly. "'And that is?' Shanghai. The pilot at first did not seem to comprehend. He could scarcely realize so much determination and tenacity. Then he cried, Well, yes, your honor is right. To Shanghai. So the tankadier kept steadily on her northward track. The night was really terrible. It would be a miracle if the craft did not founder. Twice it could have been all over with her if the crew had not been constantly on the watch. Aouda was exhausted, but did not utter a complaint. More than once Mr. Fogg rushed to protect her from the violence of the waves. Day reappeared. The tempest still raged with undiminished fury, but the wind now returned to the southeast. It was a favorable change, and the tankadier again bounded forward on this mountainous sea, though the waves crossed each other and imparted shocks and countershocks which would have crushed a craft less solidly built. From time to time the coast was visible through the broken mist, but no vessel was in sight. The tankadier was alone upon the sea. There were some signs of a calm at noon, and these became more distinct as the sun descended toward the horizon. The tempest had been as brief as terrific. The passengers, thoroughly exhausted, could now eat a little and take some repose. The night was comparatively quiet. Some of the sails were again hoisted, and the speed of the boat was very good. The next morning at dawn they espied the coast, and John Bunsby was able to assert that they were not one hundred miles from Shanghai, a hundred miles, and only one day to traverse them. That very evening Mr. Fogg was due at Shanghai if he did not wish to miss the steamer to Yokohama. Had there been no storm, during which several hours were lost, they would be at this moment within thirty miles of their destination. The wind grew decidedly calmer, and happily the sea fell with it. All sails were now hoisted, and at noon the tankadier was within forty-five miles of Shanghai. There remained yet six hours in which to accomplish that distance. All on board feared that it could not be done, and every one, Phileas Fogg, no doubt excepted, felt his heart beat with impatience. The boat must keep up an average of nine miles an hour, and the wind was becoming calmer every moment. It was a capricious breeze coming from the coast, and after it passed the sea became smooth. 
Still the tankadier was so light, and her fine sails caught the fickle zephyr so well that with the aid of the currents John Bunsby found himself at six o'clock not more than ten miles from the mouth of Shanghai River. Shanghai itself is situated at least twelve miles up the stream. At seven they were still three miles from Shanghai. The pilots swore an angry oath. The reward of two hundred pounds was evidently on the point of escaping him. He looked at Mr. Fogg. Mr. Fogg was perfectly tranquil, and yet his whole fortune was at this moment at stake. At this moment also a long black funnel crowned with wreaths of smoke appeared on the edge of the waters. It was the American steamer leaving for Yokohama at the appointed time. "'Confound her!' cried John Bunsby, pushing back the rudder with a desperate jerk. "'Signal her,' said Phileas Fogg quietly. A small brass cannon stood on the forward deck of the tankadier for making signals in the fogs. It was loaded to the muzzle. But just as the pilot was about to apply a red-hot coal to the touch-hole, Mr. Fogg said, "'Hoist your flag!' The flag was run up at half-mast, and this being the signal of distress, it was hoped that the American steamer, perceiving it, would change her course a little, so as to succor the pilot-boat. "'Fire!' said Mr. Fogg, and the booming of the little cannon resounded in the air. End of chapter 21